This episode of Hack5 is brought to you by Domain.com. Hello, welcome to Hack5. My name is Darren Kitchen. It's your weekly dose of technology. We're playing with drones again this week. Actually, not these guys. Uh, sets under some repair as we get ready for some new fun stuff in the new year. So let's just travel into my office here and uh, get into it because we got a lot of awesome feedback from not last week's episode. I'm sure that was a train wreck. But the uh, episode about um, our drone, our denial of drone attack, which was a lot of fun. So thanks for tuning in. Thanks for supporting that. And I would like to uh, kick off a little thing called Perch and Stare. That's right. I'm just going to stare at you now. This is very boring. Uh, no, actually, what I'm talking about, Perch and Stare, is, um, is an element of a competition that DARPA, or the Department of Defense Advanced Research Project, had just a few years ago. Um, you may remember these guys from little projects like the DARPA Grand Challenge to create a driverless car or this little quaint thing called the internet. And so these guys are kind of cool because they put money behind neat stuff and they had a, uh, a contest, uh, UAV Forge. It was crowdsourcing, a whole bunch of really interesting UAV development. Uh, the contest had all of these different specifications like being able to go out like uh, beyond line of sight and land on a place and perch and monitor and avoid obstacles and stay under a thousand feet and all these other interesting things, which was really cool and I ran into this recently after, you know, playing with these drones and the first thing that comes to mind is, hey, 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 let's put a pineapple on it, right? Let's do some monitoring because I could potentially uh, put this somewhere where I would like to do some packet sniffing that I wouldn't otherwise be able to easily access. And that's a really uh, interesting concept. So I looked into it and it turns out I'm not the first person to have ever thought of this, in fact, um, just this current DEF CON, I don't know how I missed this talk, but Ricky Hill at DEF CON 2013 gave a talk on doing just that by taking, he took a, well at the time, a Wi-Fi Pineapple Mark IV and the, uh, this guy, this previous gen uh, drone by DJI, um, good stuff, and he, uh, you know, used it to do that perch and monitor and I was like, ah, all right, well let's step up the game, okay? So what I would like to do now, and this is very much a proof of concept segment, so I am nowhere near having all the bugs ironed out, but I thought I'd share with you the, the development of it. Uh, what I'd like to do is take the, uh, the current gen uh, latest drones from uh, DJI, because these are ridiculously easy, um, and pair it with the latest gen Wi-Fi Pineapple. So take the Mark V and then um, you know, pair it with a 12-volt uh, battery here, as well as an inexpensive uh, prepaid GSM phone. Now, I'm starting with the Phantom, the second-gen Phantom, and a lot of people wrote in and said, hey, why haven't you, you know, developed your own? Because there's an entire community of making your own. There's some really cool resources I'll have in the show notes for that. And I'm working my way into that, but I figured I should probably learn to fly first, and this is one of those things that's super simple to learn on, so I highly recommend that as a platform. Uh, and I've gone ahead and removed this camera here. So this is the, let's see here, I think it's five ounce, 4.8 ounce. Uh, this is basically just a Wi-Fi network camera that uh, ties in with the rest of the, the system there. So we're taking this off and replacing in its place because we need every ounce we can get as well as I wanna make sure that we actually have a decent center of gravity here. Um, we're going to go ahead and put in our Mark V, as well as our 12-volt battery. This is the 18-hour battery I was talking about in the last segment. Um, I would use a smaller, say, last-gen pineapple juice, but this is only 5-volt, whereas this is our smallest 12-volt guy, and I really am going to need to use that because the last piece of the puzzle here is our T-Mobile prepaid phone. I love you guys over at T-Mobile because you can just buy a SIM card in cash and all they do is ask you to write your name down on a sticky note. Actually, although on that, I must say, <laughs> what on earth were you thinking? The, the prism too? Really? Really T-Mobile? The prism. I guess we haven't learned anything. Okay, well anyway. Um, so with all of that and then of course the cables that we're gonna need, that brings us up to what now? Like, ah, 15, 15.3, 15.4 ounces. So 
my flight time is not going to be anywhere near 20 minutes, but that's fine because, um, you know, I'll get into the rest of the drone stuff, but I sh on the roof. So let's just go fly now and then I'll talk to the rest of it. Although I should say that you could go with a much lighter system for the camera. However, um, I'm not doing that because I'm actually using the cell phone for its data connection to do an auto SSH reverse uh, connection right back to my virtual private server so that I can um, control it. And then I can also use this for GPS and I can use the camera on board to help me navigate and get to the rooftop that I want to get to. So speaking of rooftops, let's go to one. Now I probably couldn't have picked a worse phone to pair for this project, but what I was going for was what is the least expensive burner that I can pick up with a prepaid SIM. Um, and this Prism 2 is absolutely horrible. Uh, it was the least expensive that I could get with an Android OS that would run, um, that would run Hangouts because I didn't want to have to reinvent the wheel. My uh, initial concept was to use WebRTC uh, or Web Real-Time Communications because it's got an awesome framework for doing uh, something very similar to Google Hangouts where you can, um, you know, just, uh, just with this framework uh, build, well, real-time video and it works on Chrome for Android except it doesn't for this phone. So I've fallen back on my Hangout idea. It's, it's not the greatest. I'm going to have to find something better. but. I do need the phone regardless, or at least either the phone or a 3G dongle to provide internet access for the, uh, for the Wi-Fi pineapple down here. So I figured I was killing two birds with one stone. Turns out um, it's going to make things exciting today. So I'm just going to go ahead and strap this guy down here with my fancy dancy rubber bands. And I'm already in a call here. And. So now the pineapple's on, it's getting internet through the phone, and as you can see here, it's, the frame rate is, it's just terrible. But it's, it's what we've got for right now, so I want to at least test the concept and, uh, and learn, if anything, if, um, if this is too much weight for this system or if I have to completely redo this with smaller LiPo batteries and, um, and dedicated uh, camera and uh, 3G hardware rather than this heavy phone. Um, so let me just make sure I'm good to go, and I am not. So with the Phantom, I've booted it up, and what I'm waiting for is for it to get a signal to uh, enough satellites in the sky. It's uh, based on GPS, and the reason for that is because it has a return to home feature, which means I'm going to be able to put it on a rooftop where I'd like to do my Wi-Fi monitoring, and then power down the motors, get as much battery life as I possibly can out of this, and uh, then when I'm ready to come home, it's simply a matter of turning off the receiver, it's gonna shoot up into the sky, make a beeline for where I came from, and land within two meters of where I took off from. So that's why we're doing it from this rooftop, and I'm trying to get line of sight to the other rooftop. Ultimately, I'd love to be able to do all of the FPV stuff over 4G, but um, baby steps. Look at this, Paul. It's just uh, right under here. Yeah. Actually, one of the advantages is uh, with a Hangout, I can get it over glass, which is kind of a novel concept. I don't know if I would really prefer that for FPV. I'd rather have like Oculus Rift or uh, Fat Sharks or some other big goggles. Uh, so I'm just using my huge phone here. But yeah, I mean, that's kind of an interesting aspect of it. You could do FPV over Google Glass it's actually not terrible right now. So the reason for the camera pointed straight down is I can actually see the rooftop and I can see me standing right there. So if I wanted to land on me, I, I could. Um, so let's give it a shot before we completely exhaust this battery, which I'm sure is not happy right now. Yeah, but can we get to, okay. Well, yeah, except if I can't recover it, I'd totally be hosed. Okay, if you say so, Paul. I mean, look at the, the video coming off of this. It's such a, narrow field. Well, you can actually see that. Really. Yeah, so I'm actually seeing the trees and stuff I'm going over. I'm really drifting. So just get the, yeah, you get the drone landing. How's that? Whoa! <laughs> Look at that! 
Oh. Oh, this is fantastic. No, okay, so it's not horrible. It's not completely flawed, uh, aside from the fact that my camera is like tilted the wrong direction. So you've kind of got to look at the phone this way. Um, that totally worked. I could look down and I could see like, oh, you don't want to land there. There's a bunch of poles coming out of the roof and, um, uh, you know, avoid the boxes over here. And, and yeah, that totally worked. Like I'm looking at concrete and so I've got it powered down now. So now I should be able to connect wi Wi-Fi Pineapple. Uh, I set it up with a boot mode script <laughs> with the dip switches to record uh, with Airmon NG to an SD card. I didn't flip the boot switches, so, um, and, I, and that was what was going to kick off the SSH to my server. So, I needed to have flipped the switches. All right, well, at least we can test this, check this out. So, I'm just going to go ahead and, because um, I can't get onto that roof uh, without becoming a ninja. And so, I'll just go ahead and turn off the remote, and in a moment, it should just come home. Uh, we hope. All right, here we go. <laughs> oh my god! Between this, la between last week's episode and this, I think like proof of concept fail. I I just realized what it was, Paul. Um, the return to home feature doesn't work when you've turned off the propellers. So when I landed and I cut the engine, it's now saying, "Okay, cool. I'm happy. I'm home." So if I turn them on again, I could technically fly it back here, but it's gonna count that spot right now as its home for its return to home. And I honestly should just hack the firmware to set waypoints anyway. But I thought I'd give it a go. So let's see if we can at least get it back. What a fail. Um, please tell me you see me. Here we go, I think. Thank God. Well, at least we covered it. That didn't go as well as I had hoped. I need to kind of go back to the drawing board on this, but still the concept is sound. You know, perch and monitor, it's, it shouldn't be too difficult to put it on a rooftop somewhere, leave it for a couple hours, record what I need on the Wi-Fi pineapple and then come home. So, yeah, at least that's the concept. I guess this is one of those things where we just need to garner some feedback and then somebody brilliant will be like, ah, well, the NASA M controller, you just give it the, the make it work dip switch and then, and then I'll remember to flip my pineapple dip switch to make my payload go and, well, anyway, it'll be epically less fail. I'm glad this is the New Year's episode no one's actually watching. We'll see you in 2014. Um, back to Shannon? <laughs> It doesn't matter if you frequency shift key or on off key. When that killer idea hits, you need to grab that domain name and the web hosting fast. And with domain.com's quick domain discovery system and easy checkout process, you'll have your website up and running in no time. I love the guys over at domain.com because they are affordable, they're reliable, they're easy to use, they're totally active on social media, like on Twitter, like at domain.com, just it makes it a fun place to do business. They've been huge supporters of Hack5 and the guys over at domain.com uh, have want to hook you guys up. So they have this special coupon code. I'm gonna let you guess what it might be. That's right, it's Hack5. Use that at checkout over at domain.com. Get an extra 15% off. When you think domain names, think domain.com. And now it's time for the trivia question of the week. Last week's trivia question was, what year did Ivan Sutherland create the first head-mounted VR and augmented reality display system? And the answer is 1968. This week's question is, what is an ECO? You can answer that over at hack5.org slash trivia for your chance to win some awesome Hack 5 goodies. We have CDs, we have flash drives, we have solid state drives, external hard drives, even floppy disks. I actually saw some in my dad's closet. And we have paper. Now, paper wouldn't be my first choice, but this is kind of interesting. There are actually programs available that will convert your files into data that can be printed and stored until you need it on paper. 
And then once you need the data, you can scan the paper and then decrypt the information saved. And you can even add a password. So this week, I decided to check out a program called Paperback. And this is a very easy program to use. All you have to do is download the file, and then you just unzip it, and you don't even have to install. It's so easy to use. This program will let you save a file that you want to print into a bitmap. And then if you have to open the bitmap, you can do that in paperback as well. And then you can scan a photo and then decrypt it in paperback all inside the program. So I'm going to go ahead and show you exactly how this program works. I'll pull it up on my computer up here. So this is paperback. Uh, when you first open it, it doesn't say anything up here. This is just from a previous scan that I had going. There's a whole lot of options that you can go through in paperback to customize your own settings depending on your scanner and your printer. So before printing, you'll want to go ahead and choose some specific options that worked for me. Uh, first off is the dot density. This is going to be the density of the dots determining the size of the data bit on the paper. The closer the dots are, the more data that you can fit onto a piece of paper. Um, my HP LaserJet can do up to 600 DPI um, for the dot density, so I put mine at the very top at 300 dpi. You can also change the dot size to whatever you'd like. I kept mine around 70%. This is basically how far each dot is from each other on the actual paper. And then the last thing I changed was compression. This reduces the size of the bitmap so that it's not a huge file and you don't end up with several dis different pieces of paper. Obviously, if you do have a large file that you want to convert onto a piece of paper to save, you should probably go ahead and turn that into a, a nice zipped file or a compressed file beforehand before you actually turn it into a bitmap. So now, what I'm going to do once I have all those settings set, I'm going to go ahead and click OK. And you can see up here you have encryption options as well. So you can encrypt your data and send a password whenever you decide to open the text. So I'm going to click OK. I'll leave those off. I'm going to go ahead and open a bitmap so you can see what it looks like in the file, in the program. And I'll go to my folder. So this is a bitmap that I had created previously, and this is just a simple photo from my Twitter account. It's my Twitter profile picture, um, exactly. So it's a very small picture. The quality map over on the right-hand side shows you how many file bits that you have going on, all the different blocks, and then if any blocks have any kind of errors, it'll show you that as well. Since mine is just full green, it basically tells you that everything's okay and I don't have any issues with the data. If I click on blocks, that'll actually show me each block on the paper. So I can go down several rows, I can go over to the right, so I can see an up close and personal photo of what's going to end up being printed. Once I am ready to go ahead and print this, I can just hit print. I'll choose open. And then I can choose my LaserJet printer and go ahead and print it. Now you don't want to change any of the optional settings that you have in your, in your HP printer or whatever printer that you actually have. You want to go ahead and just leave it to whatever the default is. So I'll go ahead and cancel out of that since I already printed out a couple of different files. And I'll show you what I came up with. So this is what you get. It doesn't look too interesting at first, but if you look up close and personal, it's actually a whole bunch of little dots that are compressed into kind of what ends up being a QR code in a way. So this first file was just a text document, and you can tell with these two, it was a much larger file. So these two were my Twitter image, and I decided to do two different ones, damage one or the other, to see if I could actually scan it back. What's interesting with this is once I scanned it, I was able to go back into paperback, and I'll go ahead and pull this up for you. So I'm going to scan a new folder, new file. So I'll go ahead and go to File 2, and oh, there we go. I'll open a bitmap file. So I saved my previously scanned Twitter image files, the QR codes for those, into a whole bunch of different bitmaps to open up in paperback. So this one tells me there's no grid. There's obviously an issue with this one. I'm going to try to open a different one. I'll try Twitter 2. Okay, so this one was able to open. Didn't have any issues opening it up, but 
there were a whole bunch of different errors that were included in this one. This one we damaged with a little bit of a smudge. We added a little bit of water on top of it to mess up the ink. When I go over to the blocks, you'll see that several of these images have errors. It'll give me little red grid lines to show me what's going on with each one and where the errors are. So the main errors that I'm getting are in the middle where I had actually smudged it. Not as many errors in this area, just a few small ones. Luckily, when you go into options, if you only have a few errors and you choose redundancy, this will hopefully fix those errors upon scanning and recovering them in paperback. So you shouldn't have any issues unless you've actually like smudged it on purpose, which is a problem. So I'll hit cancel. So we're getting errors whenever we scan, but what if I just decided to save a bitmap from paperback that I've already encrypted to be a printable document, and I just decided to save it, leave it in some kind of encrypted drive, and open it up on a different computer? I can do that too. So I'm going to open a bitmap. Oops. I'll go ahead and choose a new file first. So I'll choose file number three. You can have up to five different documents open at the same time in paperback. And I'm going to open up a new bitmap. So I had ended up saving this Twitter image as a separate bitmap. And I also saved a whole bunch of other images too, the Hack5 wallpaper. I saved a bunch of pr pictures that I had downloaded. I even saved a simple Word document over here. So if I choose the simple Word document, I'll ho hit open. It'll unencrypt it. It'll show me that it's perfectly fine, all the quality is there. So I'm going to choose Save. I'm going to save it on my desktop as a .txt file. And I'll call it Technolist Hack 5. So when I hit Save, go ahead and go to my desktop. And here's the Technolist Hack 5 document. OK, so I know that this is exactly what I had saved previously inside paperback. So it works for figuring out what kind of QR code, what kind of dots are going on on each piece of paper. Unfortunately, though, it does have a huge problem whenever you try to print something. You basically have to keep it in pristine condition, like keep it in a safe or something, until you actually want to scan it again. I did try several different scans of the pristine document that I have here in my hand, and none of them worked right. I kept on getting errors on each one. I kept on having issues. This isn't the only program out there that does this kind of um, scan data. You also have a whole bunch of other ones for Linux as well. Um, I know some of you guys out there have probably tried it. So for me, is it worth it? N not, not to me. Yes, it does keep prying eyes off of your data because you can't use a man-in-the-middle attack on physical printed information, although you can use you know, a social engineering attack on someone and coy them into giving you their papers. But in my experience, a flash drive will pretty much survive a laundry washer, of course, and you can encrypt a flash drive, but a piece of paper, that won't survive as long as a flash drive will, at least not in my position, in my experience. So that was Paperback, a very interesting product. I have to say it's not for me, but I want to know what you guys think and if this is something that you'd actually enjoy using. If it is, make sure to leave me an email, feedback at hack5.org, and definitely check out more. And hopefully I'll check out some more as well in the future. And we're back with the Technolus photo of the week. This one comes from Christopher. He sends us this photo and he says, I know you like cats, but my dog Charlie loves watching the show too. That was so cute. I love his little ears. So adorable. Now, if you want to share your Technolus photos, you can send them to feedback at hack5.org with the subject line Technolus so that we can find them real nice and easy. And that about wraps up this episode of Hack 5. Happy New Year's to everyone. I know you're having a good Merry time. Merry New Year's. Hopefully. Doing your own. Yeah. People have commented that we used to drink on the show and we no longer do. So here's Surprise. to December. Cheers. And cheers. Making up for the last year. 
of not joining you guys because I know that you're sitting By right there. By drinking 365 days worth of drinks in <laughs> one night. No, no, no. This is cheers to the guy in the hoodie with the headphones sitting there with the second monitor in the IRC. You know oh, I'm talking yeah. to you. He sent a picture cheers. To, he sent a Technolust photo to us. Did he really? No. Did, <laughs> what? <laughs> I just did the star dot star. <laughs> I remember the first time I heard Star to Star and I'm looking for the star key and I'm like, what? There's no star oh, key. That's hilarious. Oh, asterisk. Oh, you're so funny. Yeah. So. You're also a good voice for Brad uh, We have a bunch of specials going on at the Hack Shop. Oh, hey. HAKShop.com. We do. All of those. Do your specials. We have fantastic stuff. Check it out over at the Hack Shop. And thank you, you for supporting us directly. Yeah. We could not do this without you. This is honestly, you are the reason that Hack 5 exists because you watch the show that's and you true. support us with the shop. Yeah, that That's is true. Pretty much how it works. And you can also go to hack5.org slash follow to find us on all of our different social networks and everything that we're doing every day on the internet. Everything that we choose to make public. Mm. <laughs> like and follow and or plus your technolus. Oh, that was good. That was good. Thank you. Uh, Thank where you. else can they go? Feedback. If you want to email us. You can email feedback at hack5.org, <laughs> so hold down the Windows key and hit R, and then type in mail to colon feedback at hack5.org and press enter, and then Just wonder don't why you don't have a mail client, because that day is coming fast. Ew, mail call clients. Unless you're using Outlook, in which case, look out! I used to have... Eudora? Pegasus? No. Incredimail? Pine? Incredimail. Oh, see, that's still a webmail service. It is? No, do you ever pop your stuff? You ever pop your IMAP? That's what I'm Oh, talking. yeah, I did that. We're going to wish you guys a happy new year. We have a fantastic 2014 lined up. Shannon's taking the reins here on Hack 5 and making all sorts of good stuff happen. So stay tuned. We've got CES coming up in just a bit. Uh, we've got Sebastian joining us for that. Uh, Sarah's going to be there as well. And we're going to lay waste to the Consumer Electronics Show. Then right after that, we've well, got ShmooCon, which is a fantastic conference where you can both get hacking and yingling, because it's only available on the East Coast. Um, Can you bring some back? No, you're stuck with Anchor Steam. Yeah, I'll bring some back. Okay. And then after that, well, after that, we're probably going to be launching season 16. 16, yeah. Which in Hex, you can leave a comment about. Yay! But until then, I'm going to remind you guys that I'm Darren Kitchen. I'm Shannon Morse. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Trust, trust your Technolus. Trust your Technolus. Truck, your truck your, to It's not a big truck. Nuts. You can just, what, where are my notes? <laughs> Bye. Bye, no, everybody. I do. Bye. Bye, no, everybody. I do. You have a giant bag of nuts? Yeah. Why do you have a giant bag of nuts? I just have a giant bag of nuts. Wow. Yeah. I wonder if those would taste good with beer. My Hello. <sighs> Welcome to Hack 5. You may remember me from podcasts such as This Weekend. Where's my. Shut up! And what? How Do You Find Your Way Home in Amsterdam? 